Now, Sports Talk with Broads. Here's Hunter Brody. I did the unthinkable. I rewatched the entire Sixer Celtics game, too. I don't know why. My brain is somehow wired to the point where it says, Broads, do it, you maniac. Do it, you stupid. And here I am, watching it all over again so I can see it another time. What the hell went wrong? And I couldn't believe it. Watching the guys try and fight over screens 30 feet away from the basket, getting torched, the same jump shot over and 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 over again. Ridiculous. So ridiculous. And I mentioned what Kemba Walker had to say after the game on the post-game podcast. And I mentioned what Joel Embiid had to say, too, about the spacing and how much room the Celtics are getting when it comes to shooting. And and just a reminder here, Kemba said, I really haven't seen that much space in a very long time. And clearly, it's a problem. And just the way that you look at it, pretty simple here. The Philadelphia 76ers played their biggest rival and lost by 27 points in a playoff game, got out-rebounded, got out-hustled. The other team worked way harder than you. When they were already up 1-0 on the series, it just makes no sense, and it's at the point now where this entire organization needs to make big-time moves, and I don't know if I feel comfortable with Joshua Harris. I don't think that this ownership group really understands what the hell they are doing. It's a nightmare up top, and I don't trust them to make the right decisions moving forward. This is going to be so nuts. The rest of this entire offseason here is going to be insane, and look at me saying the rest of this offseason, as if the offseason already started, but I hate to break the news to you. It did because this Sixers team sucks. They suck. They suck. They are the worst basketball team I've ever seen in my life when it comes to work ethic and, and, and the mental side of the game. They are going to need a whole entire new organizational philosophy. And I don't trust that the people in charge know that, number one. And two, I don't trust them making the proper decision. This ownership group is the same with the Devils, and they want to buy the Mets. They are a joke. They are all about the business side of things, more so than the actual winning side of things, and that's why deep down, I think we are doomed. I think we are doomed. The way I want this to go, the most realistic thing I see, let's go that way. The, The most realistic thing that I see is Elton Brand staying, getting a new head coach in here, and then trying to move one of these big contracts, whether it's Tobias or whether it's Al Horford. But you look at these contracts, holy hell, there's not one team out there that's going to want to take these. That's just flat out realistic. And if they have to come into next season with the same damn roster, this is going to be horrendous. And I talked about how this ownership group, they're all about the money. Well, guess what? This fan base is going to be so checked out. If you sell us, hey, here's Josh Richardson, Tobias Harris, Al Horford, Shake Milton, Ben Simmons, and Joel Embiid with Matisse Thibel. And hey, we got you a new coach. Okay, I'm sorry. We need way more than just a new head coach. It's pretty damn clear that all around there are big time holes with this entire team. Now, Jackie McMullen had some very interesting comments to say about this current squad. And Tim Legler was on 97.3 ESPN with Mike Gill and myself. And he sure was having a field day about Brett Brown. So I want to dive into those audio cuts as well. But before we do, this episode is sponsored by Orbit Energy and Power. And with over 20 years of experience in the solar industry... They are home to your solar experts. Their solar program helps eliminate your electric bill completely, offering flexible financing solutions such as zero dollars down. In addition, they will make sure you receive all the state and federal incentives when switching to solar. Make sure you check out their information. It's in the description. So before we get to these audio cuts, I'm just so baffled, really, because the future was so bright. You had so many assets. You had so much money available. 
And somehow, just like that, here we are. And we got suckered in. Uh, I know there's people out there going, I've been saying this since they signed Al Horford. This was going to suck. Okay, you keep telling yourself this. We got sucked in to bully ball, to the defensive intensity, to that 5-0 run that they started out hot, running through the league early. 5-0 run. Oh, here we go. They're 5-0 to start the season. This team is legit. This team is sick. We got suckered into thinking, okay, this is different. It's not the same way that everybody else is playing, but they're going to be longer. And because they're going to be longer, their defense is going to be another level. And this team is going to suffocate every squad they ever play. And uh uh-oh, uh-oh, what happened to that defensive intensity? Nobody feels like playing hard anymore. I blame everyone. I blame literally everyone. Tobias Harris, to put out that type of performance in the playoffs where you're missing layups left and right and you go four for 15 on the night, it's flat out embarrassing. And here's the thing. He's a nice guy. We can all agree that he's a nice guy, but that doesn't fly right now. It seems like that's what this team is. Brett Brown, we can all agree that he's a good human being, right? There's no way you could look at Brett Brown and go, that that guy's just an asshole. No, no one would ever say that about that guy. Good guy, but it's not working here, all right? It's not working here. Tobias, good person, great guy. Love what he's doing for the community and, and the movement and all of it. Not good enough. We need more out of you, way more. And when you look at his cap hit for the next couple seasons, ew, I want to vomit. I think I actually did vomit when I looked it up. Mid-30s, high 30, millions per. Who wants that? Nobody wants that. And you need more out of him. I I tried telling myself, hold on. If Ben Simmons takes the step we need him to, if Joel Embiid is very, very strong, because we've been claiming for a while that the team is only going as far as those two stars take you. Those two stars need to groom. They need to develop. And once they do, well, then you'll be all right. They'll take you there. And then I try and convince myself, okay, well, if it's on those two, if those two do figure it out, and Tobias is your third option, are you okay? If you can move away from the Al Horford contract and utilize that money to maybe get some better pieces around these guys, is that okay? And I I just don't know if it is anymore. And Al Horford, dude, come on. Where's the will? There's no way he fell off to this level. I'm sorry. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying that Al Horford stinks this much. You know what's going to happen. If if there is, if there is, and I pray that there is, if there is an organization willing to take Al Horford, and whether that's the Sixers taking on money or giving up draft picks with it or whatever the case may be, this is a big-time hypothetical, but if he goes somewhere else, I promise you he's going to be doing a lot better than he is here. I, I don't think that he is a five point per game guy, a four point per game guy with two rebounds. He's too smart of a basketball player for that. And that's why it bothers me because I feel like he's not bothered enough by what's happening. He's obviously going to look back at his time here after his whole career and go, holy hell, was that miserable. But I feel as if he doesn't care. How does he not care? He's getting embarrassed out there. And that's why regardless of scheme or, you know, not believing in the head coach or frustration or whatever, they're not even working hard. Work hard. Give me that. Give me the effort. Watch them do what they do. You call timeout. Watch them go to the bench, hunched over. The the body language is ridiculous. Clearly upset. Clearly aggravated. You can see they're defeated. And that's a big time issue. It it really is. This team, it's one of the most frustrating things in the world. I I thought that going into this series, I wouldn't be too emotional because I went into this knowing, look, there is no chance. This team is not good enough. You've seen them through this point. You lose Ben Simmons, and they weren't good enough even with Ben Simmons to get the job done. 
I knew it was going to be miserable. But somehow, some way, they found a way. Leave it to the Sixers to make me want to rip my eyes out of its socket. Stab my eyes out. That's how bad it is. Somehow, some way, they did that even when I already knew they were going to lose the series. And that's because they decided to go out there and play the worst brand of basketball I've ever seen. So shame on Brett Brown because he's not making adjustments when he needs to. And I thought last year against the Toronto Raptors when they went seven, he did a decent job going up against Nick Nurse and that Raptors team who had the superstar in Kawhi Leonard. It goes seven games. It goes down to the wire like that. Could he have made different changes later in that fourth quarter where things got a little wonky with Jimmy Butler and all that? Sure. But in terms of the whole window of the seven-game the seven game series, I thought, you know, he did all right against that team. Because if you think about it, he, he had the series with Boston the year before, got outmatched completely by Brad Stevens and the Celtics. The following year, they go seven with the Raptors, and, and they won the championship. And I thought, okay, look, that's a step. That's a step in the right direction. You're seeing him make the right moves and battle with this team, and then now somehow they took 10,000 steps backwards, if not 10 million steps backwards. So, you know, shame on Brett Brown because I think he's he's acting like a child hearing him speak post-game and seeing what he's doing in this series. A child is the way that I see Brett Brown in this series with what he has done to this point. And I'm very shocked because, you know, there's Brett Brown haters out there. We go, oh, bro, I've been telling you for 10 years. Well, that's just someone who, in their mind, already hated Brett Brown. She would never give him credit for anything that he does. You can't look at that, that series against the Toronto Raptors and say, well, Brett Brown just coached the worst series of his life. No, what he left you in that series, he should intrigue you based off of, okay, well, the last season he got abused by Brad Stevens. The next series, here you go. You have a seven game with the eventual champions. How can you say that there's not a step in the right direction, just like with players, steps in the right direction. But here, I'm sorry, there is just no way that you could defend anything that Brett Brown has put in terms of strategy throughout this series. It's It's been a legit nightmare. So let's go to what Jackie McMullen had to say about Joel Embiid. And, and this was very, very, very head-scratching to me when I heard her say this. And this was on... The new ESPN show. You know, Mike Golick, his run is over, and they have Jay Will. Who is the show? It's Zubin Mahenti and uh, Jay Will, and there's one other host that is slipping my mind, so I apologize, but here we go. Joel has has signaled to me in his comments on J.J. Reddick's podcast, and then as this series has gone through its first couple of games, um, you know, his feelings about where the team is and, and, you know, just, I think it's hard to win when you don't seem to have your star completely bought in. Huh? Not completely bought in. Now that is very open-ended. That's very broad. I should say, is she saying not bought into Brett Brown, not bought into this roster, which could be Elton Brand, not bought into this organization as a whole. Well, here's the thing. Whether he is bought in or not, and you can say it's fair for him not to because of how this is all played out, so okay. If you are a professional athlete, you you have to go all out. You have to leave everything out there. And he's the farthest thing from the issue when you look at that effort offensively and all that. Like, it's hard to blame a guy when you look at his stat sheet, although I didn't think he gave his full best, best effort out there on the defensive side of the floor, and maybe that's because that's the way the Sixers want them to do it, so he has more to give when it comes to the offensive side of the ball. Hey, Joel, why don't you just stay back a bit so you don't have to utilize so much of your energy because we want you to play 38 minutes. You got to give it to us on the offensive side of the ball in the low post where you're banging up against another guy for so long. Uh, Maybe that's the way they're approaching it. But whether you are bought in or or not bought in, you you got to give us every little piece of sweat that you have in your body as a professional athlete. That's your job, right? If you are an accountant, you might not believe in what your boss is telling you to do, but you have to do it. You have to do it. That's your job. All right? So with Joel Embiid, that's ridiculous to me. 
Concerning, no doubt. And that's why, I mean, I already know this. This organization is in big-time trouble. They are going to need an entirely new face. I'm not saying in, in terms of like, oh, they got to get rid of Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid, although I know that's already a conversation. Oh, these guys can't work together. I, I'm not ready for that yet. I'm sorry. Me personally, I'm not ready for that. There might be a time where that door opens. It's not today for me. Somehow, some way, I already hear that, oh, well, Ben Simmons, he's a problem. I'm sorry, how do you watch game two and then your thought process is Ben Simmons is the issue? He wasn't even playing. How was that possible? There's no way in hell my takeaway from game two is Ben Simmons is a problem. He needs to shoot more. I've already heard that. I need to see this team, specifically Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid, with a new coach first. Before I even start talking about that transition. But what I really need is one of these two big contracts to get the hell out of here. With the new coach. I think they stay with Elton Brand. And from there, I think that's enough to satisfy us. If they got a new coach and they moved on from one of these big contracts and and made other moves, of course, to fill that void of the money they get rid of, I think that's a starting point. I don't even think this is a one off season type deal. It's a long term project again. Yup, you heard me right. That's where the 76ers are. More on Jackie. Listen, Matisse Seibel gets the start for Ben Simmons. Let's let's remember that this is a team that is down Ben Simmons, who over the course of the regular season, nine hundred and ninety times guarded an all star. So they, they put him on whoever was the all-star for the opponent from positions one through four and occasionally five in switching situations or whatever they might need if Joel is off the floor. You know, you are missing an elite defensive presence and somebody who helped you put pressure at the rim and create easy shots and transitions. So I don't want to underestimate the loss of their second all-star. Um, uh, look, she's talking about Ben Simmons when it comes to the how great he is. I was frustrated with the people who watched game two and their takeaway from it was, you know, Ben Simmons has to go because he's not willing to shoot the basketball and and all of that nature. We've been down that road so many times before. Now is not the time for that conversation. What Jackie McMullen brings up is, look at what you lost. You try and go at Matisse Thibel. He got destroyed. He got embarrassed out there with that minus 30 rating from Jason Tatum. Matisse Thibel is a fun, exciting player. He ain't ready for the big moments locking down guys for a true playoff series yet. And most rookies aren't. To be fair, most rookies are not. But that's where this roster is. If you did have Ben Simmons, Ben Simmons is ready for that moment. And and still, I don't think that changes the series insanely. It's a, it's a big loss. I don't think it changes the series insanely to the point where the Sixers win. They might be able to win a, a game or two more than they would without him. But she, she brings up a great point with what you lose in his defensive versatility and what type of players he's consistently defending. It's remarkable. And and to see the team without him, I think you should appreciate Ben Simmons more, if anything. That's the road you should go down. That should be your takeaway is, wow, look at the defense that you miss out on. But, of course, nobody likes the defense when it comes from Ben Simmons. They only like it when it comes from Matisse Thibel, Joel Embiid, and other players. For some reason, Ben Simmons doesn't get the credit when he plays the lethal elite defense. It's pretty shocking how that works. But Matisse Thibel goes one for two. uh, Tobias Harris goes four for 15, 0 for two. Al Horford, two for three in 23 minutes. I mean, guys, if that is the level of production from some of the key rotation players, you're going to have a hard time beating the Boston Celtics. And you couple that with the fact that the Boston Celtics were the team with the 1-0 lead and played with more urgency, it's going to be hard to win. Yeah, she's not wrong at all. But you hear, you hear the stats right there. You saw, too, with your own eyes. And somehow my dumbass watched it. Two times. Al Horford gave you nothing. Tobias Harris gave you nothing. You're not going to win when they give you nothing. You're not going to win. We thought it would be possible if Joel Embiid dominated. If he scored 30 plus, 40 plus, grabbed 20 boards, 18 boards, there was a way that they could figure it out. There ain't no way. There's not. 
at this point, the Celtics are doubling him and even tripling him at times, and they got nothing. Now, I will say, offensively, they don't have anything anyway. It's almost as if if that happens, they don't have a plan B. Most plays have a secondary option. Okay, if this doesn't work in the play, you have a secondary option to go to. They don't have a secondary option because guys are just standing around. And that goes on Brett Brown in, in this case, and it's it's a miserable watch. It, it's just that simple. It's really hard to watch. It's to the point where it irritates you. You're almost lost for words because these are NBA players. And at some point, I look at them and go, you're an NBA player. You're an NBA player, and you're just standing there? Do something. Do something. It's ridiculous. Now, let's get to Tim Legler cuts. Now, this is where the Brett Brown haters are going to love it because he ripped into him a little bit. Let's get to the offensive side of the the ball here. Okay, this is Legler, Tim Legler on the Sixers offense issues being on the coach. All the eyes are looking at Embiid, and it's because there's just stagnancy yeah. on the weak side. And again, that is 100% coaching. That's just design, play construct. How are we going to get better player and ball movement and get my best player in a position where he catches the ball in better positions to be more efficient and also leads to stuff on the weak side of the floor if double teams do come? I don't know if any thought even goes into it when I watch them play. I will say, Legs, very smart basketball mind, knows a lot about the game. I thought he was a little... Uh, I'm not going to say, he, he almost gave the players a free pass. And you know me where I don't do that. I blame the players in every sport over every single coach because you're the one out there. Tobias Harris going four for 15 is on Tobias Harris going four for 15. And and he was a coach earlier in his day, so he's very pro coach. He made it seem like the Sixers roster, you can hide certain things in the roster with the with the with the coaching to the point where you can get a lot done with this roster. And I don't think you can get a lot done with this roster. I don't think you can hide much. You can't. You can't hide much with this roster. They are that flawed. If you're going to be relying on Shake Milton and Matisse Thibel to score you buckets and to do things offensively, you can't hide this. This roster is so poorly constructed that it is what it is. Now, Brett Brown or a coach can do a better job than Brett Brown, I'm sure, but that doesn't fix the big-time issues here that this roster needs a whole entire new overhaul, and that takes time to get to. I'll, I'll play a couple more here when it comes to Brett Brown. Um, Tim Legler here. Part of it is on Embiid, but other part is on Brett. Part of it is, yeah, I wish Embiid had a better motor. I wish he played hard all the time. Yeah, that's something that's that's innate into him. Uh, I wish Tobias Harris was a guy that, you know, seemed like he wanted it more in these moments. Yeah, those are internal things that Brett Brown can't control. But I also think if they believed more that they, what they were walking out onto the court with in terms of just preparation, man, that gives you confidence as a player. And I will agree with him on that. I've been very consistent with – how much percent I think an NBA coach has. 15 to 20 percent is the range that I think an NBA coach has on a basketball team. When you think about LeBron winning championships, when you think about the Warriors winning championships, does anyone ever go, you know, you know what Steve Kerr did that was just so fantastic to win the championship? No. You say, damn, Steph Curry. Steph Curry and Klay Thompson, they went off. Kevin Durant went off. LeBron James had that monster block. Ray Allen hit that big-time three. No one walks away from these championships and goes, ah, remember game three when Ty Lue just did the most perfect thing in the world? That's that's not how I see it. I'm all about the players being the ones. But the 15 to 20%, I, I can agree with legs there, where it's, hey, you know, maybe the team... They don't, they don't feel that vibe with the coach. They don't feel like they are properly prepared for the game the best that they can be. But then I'll dive back and go, that doesn't give them a free pass to not bust their ass every single time on the court just because you don't believe in it. You still need to find a way. That is your job as a professional athlete. I'll leave you with one more. When we go to there's a there's a lot of cuts here. He was fired up throughout the entire day. Here's here's a 
a discussion about the offense being built around and be like it once was. Their offense should probably look different than a lot of these teams, okay, because you have this weapon. And I've said it before, he's the only guy since Shaq in his prime, go back 20 years, that you could run a low post-based offense through if pretty much you know, the majority of your offense and actually win a championship if you're committed to it and you make it a little easier on him. But see, that's where I go with the team isn't built right. So while he's ripping Brett, and I think it could be both, right? Brett Brown's philosophy is not great. Roster's not great. Players aren't giving it to you. I mean, that's what it is. Essentially, that's what it is. That's why I blame everyone. That's why I sit here and I say I blame everyone. But a statement like that tells me uh, you want the whole offense to change. Who? What? What do you want with this roster right now? How would you set this roster up differently? All right, so you want some more movement, which which we all do want more movement. But more movement still loses to the Boston Celtics. And that's where I say, I put my hands up. Sorry, I put my hands up. This is what it is. It's a complete nightmare. I can't believe it's a real scenario. But the 76ers are screwed and screwed for a long damn time. And, and I ended the last podcast with a similar statement. When we're in the middle of the playoff run, and here we are discussing the future, discussing the moves that need to be made, discussing the fact that this team has no chance and they're going to have to make monster moves that's going to take more than one offseason, that's really telling. Instead of, oh, this is what the team needs to do for Game 3. Who the hell cares about Game 3 at this point? No one. If you do, you're nuts. You're more nuts than I am. Thank you all so much for listening. Support for Sports Talk with Broads is brought to you by Manscaped, who is best in men's below-the-belt grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. They obsess over their technology developments to provide you the best tools for your grooming experience. There's nothing worse than making sure that everything looks good down there, but you get a little zzz and you cut yourself. The blood's going, oh, what are you going to do? You need to make sure everything's smooth. Well, you don't have to worry about that with the Lawnmower 3.0, with the advanced skin-safe technology which has a cutting-edge ceramic blade, the water-resistant technology for the shower, the LED lights to make sure you don't miss any areas, the 7,000 RPM motor with quad stroke technology. I want you to experience this firsthand. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code BROD at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code BROD. Game three tomorrow. Who cares? Thanks for listening. See you next time.